welcome to the GoTo Podcast. Each episode covers the brightest and boldest ideas from the world's leading experts in software development. Tune in for practical lessons, compelling theories, and plenty of inspiration. GoTo gathers the brightest minds in the software community to help developers tackle projects today, plan for tomorrow, and create a better future. Stay up to date with the latest in tech through GoTo's top-rated events held online and in person in cities like Amsterdam, London, Copenhagen, and Chicago, and by subscribing to the GoTo Conference's YouTube channel, where you can find thousands more high-quality dev talks. Learn more at gotopia.tech. My name is John Landrieu. Uh, I've been working in the software industry for... uh, for about 20 years. I think it's actually more than 20 years now. Um, and uh, well, but technically I still rank my greatest achievement. It's kind of linked to my a previous session I did at GoTo, the talk that I did quite a bit before I delivered it at GoTo, um, which, which currently still has me listed, I think, uh, pretty much I might even still be number one in the search results for the Google term swearing and nudity. Uh, but I'll let you work out why that is. Uh, notably, Nothing to do with either swearing or nudity, despite Google's uh, best efforts to to you know to remain relevant. Um, thankfully, <laughs> so um, th- this is a talk about stories, the stories we tell others about who we are, the, the stories we tell about where we've been, the stories we tell about where we want to go, and perhaps who we wish we were. So. The time is about September 2000. Now, Harry and Sally meet for the first time when they start as graduates at the National Institute for Romantic Comedies. They were both excited to start their new job and their new team seemed really friendly. They were both feeling optimistic, energized and positive. After their first meeting, Alf, an older team member, commented on how cheery the new starters were. Ah, he laughed. They haven't seen what it's really like. So now we find ourselves in Bromley, southeast London. The year is 1934 and the time about 10.23 a.m. Gillian, aged eight, is sat in her school classroom, twirling her long, dark, curly hair through her fingers and staring out of the window. Her legs swing idly back and forth under her chair. Gillian! The teacher's hand slaps down on the small school desk, making the ink pot leap up into the air, splashing ink all over her page. She sits bolt upright, looks up at her teacher. Yes, miss? The teacher glares down at Gillian, her eyes staring over spectacles perched on the tip of her nose. She glances down at Gillian's work. What a mess. You'll have to start it again. Pardon me. But you spilt my ink, Gillian protests. I can see your handwriting, but I can't read a word of it. The ink is of no consequence. The teacher reaches down and tears the ink splattered page from the book. Do it again or you're heading to the headmaster. Gillian sighs, dips a pen in the ink and starts again. As she did this, her feet begin to swing back and forth, kicking the floor. Gillian, the teacher's voice screeches across the classroom again. Just sit still and stop wriggling about. Sorry, miss, she said, crossing her feet under a chair to stop them wriggling. A moment later, a small piece of scrunched up paper hits Gillian on the back of her head. It falls to the floor under her chair. She shoots an angry look behind her, but the girl shrugs with feigned innocence. Gillian, for the last time! A moment, pardon me, for the moment, the teacher's voice almost made her fall but she grabs her by the wrist and pulls her up to her feet. What is this? Asked the teacher, snatching the paper from her hand and opening it up. The classroom falls deadly silent as the teacher adjusts her glasses to read. Wriggle bottom. The class bursts into laughter. The teacher sighs. Just sit down, Gillian, and see me afterwards. The time is March 2017. And the place, Manchester, my house. My partner of nearly 13 years has just told me she wants to leave me. I knew the relationship had been struggling, but I was blind to the reality. It completely threw me. 
I was still very much in love. and We have two children. I swung between the feeling of loss for the relationship and the sheer panic of what the hell happens now. We've been together since I was 19. And over the years, as we grew up together, we also grew apart. It seemed like everything was collapsing, not just the relationship, but my entire identity. I realized that I'd become a we before I knew who me was. And now without that we, who the hell was I? So, trapped in a crisis of identity, I set out to recreate myself. I wanted to transform myself, to be someone else, anyone else, just not the broken person I felt I was. So, I'd like to invite you all to close your eyes for a moment. And I'd like you to take a deep breath. And hold it for a second. And then breathe out as slowly as you can. And now, just let your breathing return to normal. But bring your attention to your breath, that sensation of breathing. And take a few breaths in your own time. Now, I'd like you to really think about this question. Who are you? Who are you really? Now, I don't mean who you want to be tomorrow or in 10 years. I want you to think about who you are here, right now, in this room, this minute, this second, right now. Who are you? Now, is this the person you are to everyone else? Who else knows this person? Lots of people, or maybe just a few, or maybe just you. Now hold, hold on to that. Take a few more breaths in your own time and open your eyes. So a few months go by, and now they are told by leadership with some fanfare that the organization is going agile. And so are they. The other team on Harry and Sally's floor had already gone agile, whatever that means. And apparently they are doing really well. Someone called an agile coach came in and said they're all supposed to start using these things called stories. And now no one is allowed to say how long anything will take, just how many points something is or something like that. Uh, Some of the team seem really resistant to these new ideas. Harry and Sally had heard about this agile thing in university and were happy to go along with it. That lunchtime, Sally grated a JIRA ticket and assigned it to Harry to read. <clears throat> and assigned it to Harry. It read, as Sally, I would like Harry to accompany me to lunch so that I can get to know him. She estimated it at eight points. Later, the school wrote to Gillian's parents and said that she might have a learning difficulty and might be better in a special school. Gillian's mother leapt into action, putting her in her best dress and putting her hair in ponytails. She took her to be assessed by a psychologist. They arrive at a grand Victorian building in London, and they are shown through to a large oak panelled room lined with shelves full of leather bound books. The psychologist, an imposing man in a tweed jacket, invited her to sit on a huge leather sofa. Her feet didn't quite touch the ground. She was so nervous of the impression she would make that she sat on her hands so she wouldn't fidget. He walked back over to his desk and asked her mother about the difficulties Gillian was having at school. She told him about her handwriting, how easily distracted she was, how she would disrupt the class and how she was always getting into trouble. The psychologist didn't talk to Gillian, but the whole time she was talking to her mother, he watched her closely. This made her feel very uneasy and confused. Listening to her mother answer these questions, it seemed that she was convinced there was something wrong with her. The coach left after six months. Things seemed okay at first, but soon the team really started to struggle. The same things kept coming up again and again in their retrospectives, and those same things made the team fail 
again and again. Harry and Sally would have lunch together most days. They could have a good moan about everything. Despite their frustration, it was nice to have each other around. Harry liked Sally. She made the last few months tolerable. She was smart, confident and funny. And everything else he felt, everything else he felt he wasn't. Out of his league, obviously. She was glad they could be friends all the same, especially with the way things had been going. They just didn't get it. It all seemed to be going so well. I mean, they even launched on time, but then it just started falling apart. It was like there wasn't enough time for anything and the pressure just kept increasing. The team couldn't work out what they were doing wrong. So have we ever seen a situation like this? A a wonderful agile coach arrives in an organization and tells them about all of the brilliant agile they are going to be doing. And at first, they might seem a little skeptical, uh, but soon they they really get, get in the vibe. Now, by the time the coach leaves, uh, everyone is pretty much scrummed up to their Kanbans and uh, really, really, they're really digging it at this point. And perhaps initially, things go brilliantly. But all of those things that, that worked at the beginning, just for some reason, they don't seem to work the way they worked anymore. And, and people start to feel uh, stuck and, and cues start to build up in all, all the wrong places. But it's okay because the agile coach left them a manual. You know, he left them a guide probably and they check it to see what they are inevitably doing wrong. When we're working with teams and individuals that are really new to a concept, the assumption when things go wrong will be that they are wrong. They're very unlikely to assume that the process that seems to be doing so well for everyone else is just not right for their context. So just before we separated, I'd taken a decision. I'd been in largely technical positions for nearly 17 years at that point, and I wanted to reorient my work so that I was working with people first. And I left my technically focused contract and started to rebrand. And then my partner left me. I was unemployed, broke, and newly single, abandoned, alone, and I had no idea who I was. So, feeling like a protagonist in my own sci-fi cliche, I did what anyone would do. I accepted a speaking gig in Detroit. I was also going to be running a workshop, but because I wasn't known at all, I sold a total of, of no places, and I ended up with two days to myself. And I headed out and explored the city with my camera. I'd never been to Detroit before. But as I walked the streets, I got the feeling of a city rising from the ashes. It's a city with problems, huge problems, that have been with them for over half a century. But it's full of hope. The people are so full of hope. Now, I was having a wonderful time, but my friends and family were worried about me. You know, I was warned of the uh, dangers of looking like a stupid white tourist wandering around the wrong parts of town. Oh, I had a call from my mother, which just started, uh, uh, darling, um, you know, they have guns in America, don't you? So on the last day, I'd been exploring downtown Detroit and I realized that in my excitement to leave in the morning, I'd managed to leave my bag and my camera's battery had died and now I have no wallet and no money for a taxi. So I started the 30 minute or so walk back to the little midtown apartment I rented. Um, And as I turn a corner, there's a man sitting in front of me. He's filthy. He's cut his head and has plastic bags wrapped around his feet. He looks right at me and sees the camera and says, Hey man, take a picture of me. I'm the real Detroit. So, how do we respond to changes, either professional or personal, especially those really big 
or sudden changes. So uh, if you just fire in any one word answers you might have to that into the chat, we'll see what happens. <laughs> How do you think? How do we respond to changes? How does it feel when we, uh, when we have a nice change? Not necessarily a relationship breakdown, that's kind of very specific, but uh, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps a massive organizational change. Wow, refreshing. <laughs> Yeah, so I know which uh, we'll be talking in a bit about uh, some groups. We know some people are in timid, scared. So, you know what? The notes that I have, the, the first answer I normally get is panic. <laughs> yeah, Gourney, change junkie. So, uh, what we have there is, is, is most likely, so there is resistance and resistance does come there, but... What we tend to do first is have some level of anxiety, okay? Unless, of course, you're corny, okay? But then everyone else will freak out, maybe just a little bit, maybe a lot, maybe extensively. <laughs> maybe they're utterly crippled by their, by their anxiety. Um, most people have some level of anxiety with that, um, with these changes that happen. And interestingly, uh, so in his 1962 book, a chap called Everett Rogers popularized this thing called the diffusion of innovations theory. And, and what he was trying to do here was seek to explain kind of how, why, and at what rate new ideas and technology might spread around a, a given population. So I, I think that many of you have actually seen this before. So we've got the actually this way. Uh, there we go. There I go again. <laughs> I've not practiced my, uh, my kind of green screen technique particularly well since Oslo. I'm still, I'm still going to point in the wrong direction. So what, what it says is, is that given a group, we introduce a new idea. Um, and the first 2.5% of that group are going to be the innovators. They're going to be like, like they're corny, basically, or the 2.5% corny right there. They're like, Woo, bring on the change. Give me all the change. Um, and, then, and then the next 13.5% of the group, we've got the early adopters. They're kind of like, well, you know, it kind of seems like a good idea. Maybe we'll, we'll uh, hold off a bit for the next upgrade. Um, and then we have the early adopters or the early majority rather. And by that point, most people are kind of digging this idea or a big chunk of the group are digging the idea. Uh, and they're kind of just kind of pull along. And we have the next group, the late majority, and they're like, oh, all right, fine. I guess everyone's doing this thing already. Uh, and then you have the laggards that they might never touch this new idea or new, new, new thing. What's interesting about this uh, is, uh, is, that, is that this was obviously 1962 research looking at specifically really looking at new technologies and the kind of like they were talking about, you know, how many people are going to buy a telephone and this kind of thing. Um, how long do we think human beings might have behaved like this? Are we talking like, you know, since 1962? <laughs> you know, since uh, for the next last few hundred years? Thousands? Millions? So I'll let, you, uh, I'll let you think about this little example. So early human beings, okay, cavemen wandering around, and it just happens that uh, a caveman called um, Corny, in this case, happens to notice this amazing, this amazing berry bush. Okay, and he's like, "Wow, those berries! I'm on that. I'm on those berries." He's munching down the berries, and, and a couple of others, maybe a total of two point five percent of that particular group, wander over, and they're all wolfing down these berries. The next thirteen point five percent, kind of, well, those berries look look kind of nice. We'll, we'll give them 24 hours. We'll see what they look like in the morning, you know. And then a few weeks later, you've got the early majority uh, and they're kind of like the next 34%. They're kind of like, well, a lot of people kind of like these berries. They seem like a nice idea. Uh, we'll give them a few more weeks and see what they look like then. The next, th you know, a few months down the line now, the late majority are like, well, everyone seems to be going on about these berries now. Oh, maybe next month. Maybe next month we'll do it. I just don't trust the berries. The, the laggards, they never touch the berries. So can you see maybe how we might all be here 
thanks to Corny the Caveman, potentially sacrificing himself for the good of the entire population. Uh, so yeah, basically we have an evolutionary bias to gleefully sacrifice 2.5% of the population to test the, the berries or whatever other new idea or development might be out there. Uh, so unfortunately, Corny, I, you know, your, your work's been really appreciated. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, there is a, a basic bias towards this, this idea that we are, there is an evolutionary be- benefit here because obviously, um, we would be basically dead if it wasn't for uh, that small group of the population uh, being willing to try those things out. Because if those berries were bad, no one else is going to touch them. Um, and uh, what, what emotion, out of interest, what emotion do you think drives this behavior? What stops the early adopters from just wolfing on the berries? What stops the, the, the early majority from doing it? What stops the laggards from ever touching it? even though everyone else seems to be, seems to be, uh, seems to be doing it. Yeah. Fear. Uh, Christian, absolutely. Fear is absolutely the, the driving force here. And what's interesting is that this fear is still there. That's what affects groups now. It is actually fear. Now, Granted, when you're deciding whether or not you know, you're going to buy the next iPhone, you're probably not thinking fear like uh, someone chasing you down the road with a, a large knife or something along those lines. But fear and anxiety affects us uh, is a, is a <laughs> graduation. Uh, there is a graduation there, not, not a, an immediate uh, response. And this is something that affects everyone. Um, and what, what's interesting about this research is it tells us that um, given an, any kind of population, and granted, there are biases, so we're obviously at a technology conference. You know what? It's not surprising to me that Corny is in the audience here because there is a bias, a known bias towards innovators within the technology sector. It's not the most surprising thing you would imagine. Um, and if you've met typical groups of engineers and the desperate desire to rewrite everything in whatever latest framework has just come out, um, then you will uh, not be surprised either by that. Um, So the interesting thing here is that despite the fact that there may be a bias towards innovators, let's say in a technology team, the majority of any team is likely to have some degree of fear, anxiety, or resistance to any change that you suggest to them, any change. There is going to be some degree of, I'm not sure about that, because it's our natural in, innate response. So if fear is everywhere, then how do we, as individuals on teams that want to introduce positive change, encourage and guide teams towards positive change when we know there is going to be resistance and challenge. So I was born in North London, a stone's throw from the old um, Highbury Stadium, Arsenal's old Highbury Stadium, if you, if you are aware of that. And after about three different primary schools came and went, I started to develop this uh, theory that maybe this school thing wasn't for me. I love learning and I still love learning, but this teaching thing was just getting on my tits. Then after my 10th birthday, we moved from multicultural North London to a a small village in North Yorkshire. Now, when I was 10, um, this was wonderful. Um, The river, the outdoors, everything was fantastic. Um, By the time I was 13 and I had this realization that I was at least an hour from anything resembling civilization, it it all started to seem a lot less wonderful. And I was really still struggling with school. My handwriting was awful. And one day when I was 14, a teacher sat me down and said, JP, I was called JP back then, you're an A-star student, but with handwriting like this, you're just going to fail. And I, I thought to myself, well, I've been failing for, uh, failing for, for 10 years now at this writing thing. I guess it's not going to get any better in the next couple of years for my GCSEs. So I, I decided to leave. So at 14, I left school. Uh, I remember very calmly sitting on my bed and explaining uh, that, that I had no plans on going into school anymore and that I was now going to homeschool myself until I was old enough to get a job. 
Now, my parents were actually pretty supportive uh, about this, but you see, my parents are puppeteers. So when I said I want to go into IT, it was kind of like a child of accountants saying, I want to run away and join the circus. Uh, so I think they were just relieved that at least I was choosing a less traditional path. Um, so at almost 16, I, I ended up uh, getting a job for a small software company. And I moved back down to London as a lodger in my old childhood home, uh, which was now being rented out. My old childhood bedroom seems now like a somewhat ironic place to start my new adult life. As you know, at 16, you're unbreakable. But as you know, at 16, you're not unbreakable. And I was that. <clears throat> but I was playing at adulthood. I was running faster than I ever could to keep up with the adults I was working with. And it was hard work. Fast forward to just before my 19th birthday and go to see if their pre-financial crash world, I was now over £25,000 in debt, still trying to keep up with my peer group, still playing at adulthood. The credit cards finally dried up, but after finding a new job, I managed to come to an arrangement with my creditors. I'd moved to Windsor and got a nice new flat. The flat was more expensive than I could afford, but I, I couldn't admit that. I even decorated it and had a house party to show all my adult friends just how grown up I was. I couldn't afford them still playing at adulthood. Fast forward eight months and I lost my job suddenly and unexpectedly. I now defaulted on the arrangement I'd come to with my creditors and I have no money for rent. I'm on the phone to my bank and they've just told me that due to my new credit status, uh, they'd have to close my account. I broke down in tears on the phone to the agent. I completely failed and no job, no money. It was finally impossible for me to pretend. I couldn't play at adulthood anymore. I was smack bang in the middle of an adult situation. It was really shit. You spend your entire childhood wanting to grow up until you grow up and wish more than anything you could just go back to when life was simpler. So unemployed and broke, I moved back in with my dad in London, back in my old childhood bedroom. And shortly after that, I got into that relationship. This lasted 13 years and wasn't great for me and wasn't great for my partner. And there I was, sat on that sofa, thinking, if only I could transform myself, then maybe everything would be better. I believe that when we look at teams or individuals or organizations for that matter, we can break them down into two parts. There is their, their context and their structure. So the context, what that means is the work and, and that's the, the stuff the team is doing um, and the people, the people who are on the team. And they both obviously interact. The context uh, being the work they do is a combination of both the people and the work. And this context changes all the time. That is incredibly unpredictable because both the drivers that create work for the team, user need, business strategy, government policy, whatever that might be, and the people working on the team are also highly changeable. Then we have the structure. And this structure is the process, the way the team is working. And again, the people. The structure is the team's response to their changing context. They build structure in response to their changing context to support it. A team notices its context has changed and realigns to it. So if you imagine this line here, so above me, you can see this, this interesting line. This orange line is the, this, this supposedly, in this case, a structure that is not changing, okay, a completely static structure. And the purple line is this context that's naturally changing over time as we go. Now, a lot of people look at this and go, ah, yeah, that is my organization. We are not agile at all. We don't change for anything. We just, we've not changed in 150 years. Never. We don't change. It's just, it never gets better, never changes. Um, 
And then we actually have a little conversation about what their organization is actually like. And I realize in most cases, I've never actually seen an organization like the last one. This is, this is what I find organizations tend to look like. Um, so what's this? This is, I, I guess, uh, uh, this point here, I think this is like, um, this is kind of like maybe this was like a, a safe implementation happening here. And then here they decided actually that didn't work. So they've gone back to whatever they were doing, scrum, waterfall, something or another. And then here they went back to sort of some bespoke thing. They paid a huge amount of money to a big consultancy firm for uh, that, that was tweaked. And then that didn't work. So they canceled that and went back to safe. And then up here they, they went, they did, oh, I can't point it out. I'm, I, I give up. I can't do that. I could never be a weatherman. So you can see it. A lot of changes happen. And in fact, even though we describe this, we say, oh, you know, big organizations, they don't change. It's like trying to turn a battleship. It takes forever. Okay. What I think it's a little bit like is, yeah, sure, it's like being on a battleship, but like being on some kind of crazy battleship where they can turn at 45 degrees in the blink of an eye, because that's what it's like. And they do that every few months. And you know what? If you're currently working in a large organization, um, this is exhausting. This is absolutely exhausting and in fact a previous uh someone who'd seen this talk before described it as as like metal fatigue if you imagine you take a piece of metal a piece of metal uh, a material that we use for its flexibility and its ability to move and change but you know what if you take a piece of metal and you bend it suddenly and you bend it suddenly again in the opposite direction you do that a few too many times the material breaks down and it snaps and that's what it's like. That's what it feels like being a person at the end of that. This is not an accurate timeline. Let's say this is 12 months. I've seen organizations that change like that over 12 months. And they're not little agile organizations. They're huge organizations. And it does feel like being on a huge <laughs> battleship or something, aircraft carrier. So then there's this as comparison. And here we have a line where the structure is in almost perfect alignment. There is obviously a lag, but what we have is a team that has autonomy to make lots of little changes as they notice their, their context changing. And what's interesting here to note is that those small changes are not possible to do externally. The only people that can make changes as smoothly and as responsively as that are the people that are on the ground looking at the context, working with it. They're the people that notice. They're the people that have the mindfulness that they would need to be able to respond like that. That last graph, interestingly, those kinds of changes, pretty much the only changes that can be made from a C-suite on a large organization because it's impossible to make the little tiny changes that would be needed, those day-to-day -day decisions. So one year on and things have changed again. Twice. First, they brought in a large consultancy firm who have restructured everything. They assessed everyone and assigned them to teams based on their skills profile. Uh, this meant that Harry and Sally were now working on different teams in different buildings. The crazy thing is that they were still working on the same product. So they spent all their time with integration issues. But at least it was an excuse for Harry and Sally to work together. Sally liked Harry. It was pretty much the only reason she was still there. He was kind, supportive, intelligent, and everyone said he obviously fancied her, just too shy to do anything about it. <clears throat> Sally submits a pull request. Pardon me. Sally submits a pull request to Harry and assigns it to Harry. It was full of merge conflicts. The description reads, oh, looks like there'll be a lot of uh, conflicts to resolve here. How about we tackle this over dinner? They meet that evening and decide to uh, follow up <laughs> the following week. Another eight months passes and the leadership announced that half the team members are being made redundant due to current economic challenges. All the consultants seem to have disappeared as well. Harry and Sally's jobs are safe, but it's all a huge shock. But at least they're back on one team again. Harry's moved into Sally's apartment. She said that he'd have to decide between his vintage comic collection and his uh, collection of historic computer equipment dating from 1986 to 2001. It was tough, but he decided on the comics. The computers now live in his parents' attic. 
After more than 20 minutes, the psychologist stands up and invites Gillian's mother to step out of the room for a few minutes to discuss something. As they walk out, he switches on a tiny radio that, sat on the, that sits on the shelves and music starts to play. As soon as the door closed behind them, Gillian gets up off the seat. All she wants to do is dance. She leaps and twirls around the room, enraptured by the music, and immediately she feels more grounded, more herself. From the hallway outside the office, her mother and the psychologist peer in through a small window. Turning to her mother, the psychologist says, there's nothing wrong with your child. She's a dancer. And he recommends that Gillian be enrolled in a dance school, which is exactly what her mother did. In a later interview, Gillian said, everyone was like me. They needed to move to be able to think. It was wonderful. This little eight-year-old girl grew up to become Dame Gillian Lynn, who, before she died in 2018, had been a dancer and choreographer for over 75 years. She was involved in over 60 shows in the West End and Broadway, including Cats and Phantom of the Opera, as well as many, many others. In his uh, book, The Element, uh, Ken Robinson talks about, um, talks about that story as well as, as well as many others and talks about the idea of finding that work, finding the work that for you is play, that work that most resonates with you. So when we're born, we are as authentic as we will ever be. We have no shame, no expectations, we're just us. And as we grow, we develop self-awareness, which is in itself fairly useful. But with self-awareness comes a sudden recognition of all the things we don't like about ourselves, all the expectations family, friends and society have of us and the gap between the reality. And we start to create the image of the person we wish we were. The, if only I had that, could do that, could sing that, could be that person. And as much as possible, our outward self projects that person. But the gap between who we are and how we are gets larger and larger. When we can't be ourselves, we end up uh, becoming, we exhibit a state called, sorry, pardon me, pardon me. We can't be ourselves. We create a state known as cognitive dissonance. Uh, that is the, the, the idea that we are holding two conflicting ideas in our brain at the same time. In essence, we're being inauthentic. I really like to dig into the definition of words, and I find that we can learn a lot from looking at how the same words are actually used in different contexts. In music, dissonance has a different meaning. That is, when we hear dissonant tones that clash, we know that feeling. It's like that uncomfortable feeling in the pit of our stomach when we hear someone scratching their nails down a chalkboard or even, uh, you know, a, a neighbor's child practicing the violin or the trumpet. And we know that feeling. But what's interesting is we feel that with other people too. We get that feeling when someone isn't really comfortable in their own skin we sense their discomfort. And the opposite of this is consonants. And that is when things feel harmonious. And again, we feel this in people as well. We sense when people are comfortable in their own skin. We feel comfortable around people who are comfortable with themselves. So this is the, a description from a, of Constance and Dissonance from the website Sibelius Academy. And I, I really love the personification in this statement. I love how the dissonant intervals have desire. <laughs> to me, this is like that ever-increasing tension between who we are and how we are. It increases like a piece of elastic. The further away you get, the harder it is just to stay where you are. This is wasted energy. <laughs> energy that could be invested on being the best version of you is wasted on trying to be something that isn't you at all. The best version of you is still you. 
We can look at wasted energy through the lens of science as well. In, in physics, we can look at the efficiency of a specific reaction by looking at the, how the energy going in is output in ways other than what we intended. So, for example, in a light bulb, if we want a light bulb, we probably want it to produce light. But a lot of light bulbs, especially the older, the older ones, also produce a lot of heat. That efficiency or the, the efficiency of the light bulb can be worked out by looking at how much of the energy we put into it, in this case electrical energy, uh, is output as light energy. And, and then obviously that stuff could be output in other ways, heat, sound, etc. The, the old light bulbs that buzz and <laughs> I don't know, catch fire probably. If the goal of a team is to deliver value to an organization, and in the case of a software team, that's probably going to be working software. The process should make it easier for the team, given their context, to deliver that value. If the process is misaligned to the team, then their progress towards their goal is impeded by the process itself. And this creates friction. And this friction wastes energy. And because energy doesn't disappear, this friction creates heat. And we see this as cynicism and eventually burnout. So as I said, I struggled at school. It turns out that I'm dyspraxic and dysgraphic. The dysgraphia, uh, dysgraphia is what affects my handwriting. And the dyspraxia affects a range of things. I have to really think about which way is left or right. I lose things all the time. I can be a bit clumsy sometimes. But one thing I really struggle with is tying my shoelaces. And any situation where I had to take my shoes off for some reason would cause me huge anxiety. Changing at the gym, taking my shoes off to go through security at the airport. It's like I'd feel so humiliated by the idea that people would find out that I can't tie my shoelaces. It was this big secret. And then I discovered these silicon laces. I could just pop them in and voila, uh, no need to tie them. And even better, they looked, the white ones looked like normal laces. No one would ever have to know. I could pretend to be someone who could tie their shoelaces. And not just that, they were tied like perfectly. I mean, I looked like a, an utter pro at tying my shoelaces. So then one day I'm going through Heathrow Terminal 5 and, uh, as I go through security, I slip my shoe off and one of the, the laces just kind of pings, snaps. And, uh, <laughs> and in my mind, the entire place was halted, obviously. The, the everyone turned and kind of pointed. Um, they were probably, if you know Game of Thrones, in my mind, this was pre-Game of Thrones, but I'm kind of imagining shame, shame, something like that. Uh, and... Uh, it was, uh, and except that was all in my head. They didn't do that. No one did that. There's an interesting paradox here. We, we all spend all of that time thinking that absolutely everyone is looking at us and thinking about us. Um, but no one is looking at us and thinking about us because everyone is thinking that everyone is looking at them and thinking about them. So my silicon lace snapped. I was looking online for some replacements and I bought a pair. Uh, only they turned out to be rainbow laces, rainbow silicon laces. And I put them on. I didn't really think much about it. And the next day, someone commented on them at work while I was making coffee. And I just said, oh, they're, um, they're silicon, actually. It's because I can't tie my shoelaces. I remember I just shocked myself. I was just like, oh, my, what? I just, I just said it. And the world didn't stop. And the sky didn't fall. And I've never felt so free. It was this realization that it was okay, that it, that it was fine, that frankly no one cared. <laughs> it was just the start of a journey for me. But that feeling that just in a small way, I was just that little bit more aligned to myself was really powerful. When a team has their ways of working dictated to them, they often find themselves working against the process. 
this is the same thing as with individuals. The team is being inauthentic, like someone trying to be authentic by copying someone who seems really authentic. A, a team trying to be agile by copying another team's process that may well be doing really well for them will just end up following the process, but not their process. This is what I call contextual misalignment. And it's important as leaders and coaches to be guiding teams toward contextual alignment. This doesn't mean telling them how to do the process. It means guiding them to discovering their own and supporting them as they discover and rediscover what this is. So a few months go by and after the redundancies, the, the team gets a new coach. Initially, everyone is very resistant. <laughs> They're still in shock from everything that has happened over the last year. The coach gives them a whiteboard. They call it a work board. Anything they're working on goes on cards on the work board. It has three columns, just to do, doing, done. All they have to do is to get what they're working on up on the board. They all get magnets to indicate who they're wor who's working on what. They're told to pick an avatar for their magnets. Sally chooses the Incredible Hulk. Harry chooses Dame Edna Everidge. One day, they stand around the board, and once a day, they stand around the board and chat about the work on there. But after a couple of weeks, they seem to just naturally stand around the board whenever anything came up. They still have their retrospectives every few weeks, but everyone seems a bit more invested in it. They're sure to make little changes as experiments after each retro. For example, they realized they wanted to get better at demoing their work, so they decided to try out splitting their done column from done and not demoed to demoed. It was only a small change, but it felt good to have some ownership over, the, what, over what they were doing and the way they were doing things, and they were making lots of small changes. Harry and Sally finally get to go on that holiday they had been planning for ages. Harry tries to propose to Sally on top of the Eiffel Tower. She tells him that is way too cheesy and he should just try again another day. The next morning, he wakes up to find a gift card for a driving experience day from Sally. It just reads, enjoy yourself and see you later. Sally's nowhere to be seen. He spends the next two hours tearing around the track with the Stig. And at the end, to Harry's surprise, the Stig gets down on one knee and proposes to him. He then removes his helmet and Sally is revealed. If you want to do a, if you want a job doing properly, she says. So after all of that, I ended up face to face with a homeless drug addict in Detroit. Hey man, take a picture of me. I'm the real Detroit. Well, I thought, my mum's words ringing in my head. I guess I had it coming. I stopped and smiled and said, I, I'm so sorry, not letting the fear of death get in the way of good British politeness. My camera's battery is dead. I'd love to take your photo, but I can't. Then I paused for a moment and said, and I, I left my wallet at home. I, I have nothing else I can give you. I'm sorry. He looked at me and I looked back at him. We just stood there for what felt like hours. And then breaking the silence, he said, can I rap for you? Well, that was, uh, <laughs> was unexpected. But I knew instinctively that the correct answer was yes, strangely. <laughs> so in the strangely intimate setting on the corner of a street, on the edge of downtown Detroit, he rapped for me. He told me his story. He told me how when you live with a heroin addiction and you have no money, you're living with withdrawal all the time. You live hit to hit, desperate for relief. He told me how two nights before someone had kicked the shit out of him while he slept. He doesn't know who it was. He just woke up with a boot in his face. He told me about his wife. He told me about his daughter. How, how much he missed her. 
how much he loved her. How he left them to protect her from the him he was becoming. When he finished, I hugged him and thanked him and we said goodbye and I continued my walk up Cass Avenue. A moment later behind me, I heard someone talking. Hey, did you get anything? The voice said. Nah, nah, my friend replied. I told you, man, we're not going to get shit from people around here, the voice said. Nah, nah, man, my friend replied. He listened to me. It's been a long time since anyone listened to me. After my relationship breakdown, I had to work out who the hell me was. But the thing I forgot is that the best version of you is still you, with all of your broken bits. But those things, like the sculptor's chisel, shape your life. They define who you are, and you will never be without them. You do your broken bits better than anyone else. They are your superpowers, and you own them. They don't own you. Life is not about redefining yourself. It's about finding where your boundaries already are and accepting them. In a sculpture, its boundaries are what make it beautiful. And they can be what make you beautiful as well. You see, when I asked you to close your eyes and think about who you are right now, that's because unlike a sculpture, many of your boundaries do change. Who you are does change over time. The trick is noticing that, aligning yourself with it, and not fighting it. When you fight who you are, you waste your energy on being that other person. And it's harder and harder to be the wonderful person you already are. The heart of personal, team, and organizational agility is alignment. Alignment to self, alignment to the team, and importantly, alignment to your context. When you're not in alignment, things feel and are harder. There is more friction, and that stops you and your team from delivering value. We need to help our teams become aware of their context so they can create their own structure to support it, perfectly aligned to the way they are working, the work they're doing even, <laughs> and the goals of the organization. Agile is not a method or a process. These things will emerge and evolve from teams working with agility. When teams have process or method imposed upon them, they can end up fighting against a system misaligned from their context and will feel often completely powerless to change it themselves. Let's empower our teams to work in their way, to be the best they can be, to be authentic and to own their own stories. So back in 2019, I uh, returned to uh, Detroit. Uh, only this time, I just delivered that very same workshop and it sold out. Over the last two years, as well, over the last, it's been more than two years now, goodness. Over the last few years, as I've reconnected with myself and discovered my superpowers, I've had more success and most importantly, made more close friends than I ever had before. As we walked up the street, me and a, a friend of mine, we found the Detroit Museum of Contemporary Art. When I walked past this just a couple of years before, it was covered in amazing murals, striped with pink and yellow. But this time, in the distance, it looked like it was all black. I thought that perhaps they were between murals, that it was a an undercoat. <laughs> As we got closer, I realized that there was a mural there. It was a simple message in white neon lights across the front of the building. It just read, everything's going to be all right. The famous lyrics from Bob Marley. When I went to Detroit the first time, I was broken and in pain. But this city, with all of the suffering it has had for over 50 years, 
was a city of community, a city of pride, and a city of hope. A city that, despite everything, is holding on to its authenticity, holding on to the real Detroit. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of the GoTo Podcast. Head over to gotopia.tech to discover lots more content from the brightest minds in software development. Mm-hmm.